the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the wheel, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we begin today's discussion, we want to mention we do have a Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider dropping us a buck a month there. But if not, hey, leave us a nice review on iTunes. It helps spread the message. Today, Taylor and I are going to be diving back into anti-Oedipus. We're going to actually finish the text. This is going to be the 10th and final seminar. And the focus of today's discussion will be covering those final two sections of chapter four, the first and second positive tasks of schizoanalysis. There's a couple of things I just want to sort of do that are in the preamble before we really get started in the meat of the actual chapter itself. Just to go back to Charles Duvall's advice about looking at this chapter first, I definitely I have to do a hard cosign for that suggestion because it really everything kind of gets tied in nicely. Like you get to see, I think, a, a bit more concretely what they're gesturing at. And I think it really provides a lot of context for the prior chapters. And so I think really reading this would like at least prepare you and like kind of if you if you know where they're going i think it help you fill in those gaps that exist between whenever they're being a more i suppose uh not obscurantist but obscure i don't know <laughs> uh, yeah i mean if you maybe gonna, i should cut that out I I, there's got to be something better uh if you're going to go on a cosine i'm going to go on a tangent um, <laughs> i agree with you and i and i don't think you need to cut this out uh you know I, I think that when Charles Stavall said that, and you can check out our, you know, you can see our archives and check out our episode with him, which was, which was really nice. I did appreciate the fact that he suggested, he did pose the question, which I think is right. a good question to pose. Like, Hey, what kind of help can you give someone starting right. anti Oedipus for the first time? And it his suggestion, works, yeah. his suggestion to start with the final chapter I think that obviously with any approach to this text, there's going to be merits and perhaps drawbacks, but I don't see it as a bad way of suggesting to read it, whether it be the first time or maybe, you know, going back and refreshing your memory, or if the first time you read it, it could have been off-putting, you know, whatever the case may be, starting with chapter four is not necessarily so bad because I do think that uh, the tone of their writing and maybe the tenor, the pitch of their intensity is is changed to a certain extent. Not that it's uh, it's muted in any sort of way, but that it it does seem a little more. The trajectories have you know coalesced a little bit more, so that the aim feels feels yeah. a little f- little easier to to track rather than at the beginning where you're kind of thrown in the midst in the middle of of a wide range of factors that can be off-putting by no means is the writing diminished i think that focus is greater and they really right are like drawing those connection points to what they set up in the earlier chapters you know i'm thinking about stuff in particular like the syntheses the three syntheses and just how that kind of like how important that is for not only this book but like deleuze's work in general relative to kant and the three critiques etc but that's just the biggest thing that I can think of off the top of my head that sort of stood out as a way to understand like the syntheses. Because they discuss here, and I forget which type of syntheses it is, but it's like pr- there's production, and then there's the system of inscription, et cetera, that follows yeah. production, right? Connection, disjunction, conjunction, right? Which, as they say, the production of production, the production of recording or registry right 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 and yeah, the, the production uh, of recording okay and the produ- the production of let's just say how do they they put it it's not enjoyment right but it's uh now my mind's blanking 
feel like I should know this at this point, but um, <laughs> yeah, of consumption, consummation, not enjoyment, but I mean, the su- it produces the subject of enjoyment who's ancillary, who's on the side, off to the side of the machines, but yeah, consumption, consummation, which, you know, is the same word in French. So it's interesting that that, that one word has all of the uh, the different connotations that consumption and consummation have in English from consummating marriage to right consuming a product or food, et cetera. So yeah, those those three and those three make more sense, I think, in reference to this difference between pre-conscious investments of interest versus unconscious investments of desire, desiring production. So being able to think about the, for example, exclusive disjunction on the molar scale versus the inclusive in terms of pre-conscious, unconscious, you know, these, uh, these ways of thinking make a little bit more sense. And, you know, also, I think that the very fact that we get the stakes of schizoanalysis, right, which they've been kind of talking about throughout the chapter as perhaps in a reaction to or negation of psychoanalysis. Here, we not only get the destructive aspect of schizoanalysis, which they talk about as a curatage of the unconscious, eliminating sort of the personal logical ego forms, etc. But these math molar forms, these statistical aggregates, but they give positive tasks for schizoanalysis. So I think we get starting with chapter four first, as you mentioned, if we did, if we were to reread at some point and begin with chapter four, you can see right off the bat what the sort of the analytic, political, revolutionary stakes of schizoanalysis would be, whereas reading front to back, you may be left in the clear whether or not schizoanalysis is simply a sort of flashy, provocative term. Right. Yeah, exactly. Psychoanalysis plus one. I want to bring up something real quick. Forgive me for this, but I just have to tie this back to narrative because I think, but it goes right back to, I think the broader themes, some of the things that the book has um, got me interested in, broadly speaking, as you're aware, I've been going back through A Song of Ice and Fire and just now that I've read this book, like I'm thinking about shit and in a different light relative to, you know, a couple of things I was telling you the other day about the Dothraki, like they have a pure gift economy, but it's interesting too with them because they are like the barbarian uh, territorial machine, right? Like they're kind of, they're the nomads, right? They're the horse lords. They don't really, they only have one sort of capital city and it's not really a city in the classical sense, right? And this goes back to like having a stock, I think. Their city is more like the that gathering that you like to talk about. It's not Cattle Hewick, but what's the the thing we've talked about before? I think we talked about it with um, Protevi, that first sort of... Enchantment. Oh, Gobekli Tepe, yeah, yeah. Go, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could definitely see that being kind of how the... There's analogies, there's analogies, yeah. right. How the story developed, but it, it's kind of interesting because, like, this does go to Protevi as well because... Because in Essos, which is kind of like the continental Europe or the East, the Far East sort of quasi stand in in the books, you have more of a kind of quasi, at least primitive mercantilist system where there's kind of these city states, they have banks, etc. So they basically gift money to the Dothraki horse lords to prevent them from attacking. So, you know, this is a theory of how the state form develops is protection money basically against these sort of barbarian raiders etc so that's kind of like one pretty cool thing that i look at in a different from a different light regarding the books but i think what's even more interesting to me is thinking about how political economy in this time within the books is very much tied to it's not filial alliance is it what would the name for the alliance be like i marry my sister into your to your brother we have an alliance because capital becomes affiliative right so that's it'd be opposite right well, a capital becomes affiliative under capitalism insofar right, right. as what they what they mean by that is that it gives birth to itself, right? This kind of because miraculous giving birth to itself. What would the term be for the type of, I, I mean, other than alliance, is there a term that kind of describes this sort of exchange or like, I feel like there might be one that I'm forgetting. Well, I mean, is it, this kind of situation? I mean, it's, it's a network that involves both, right? Isn't so much of the narrative sort of interested in the interworkings of alliance and affiliation, right? I mean, well, I guess just, I mean, so the political economy 
in the sort of historical epic of the book is a lot of it is so much predicated on blood and family and like marriage, right? So it's almost like ma marriage is not a uh, – so it's a contrast to today, and this goes to Anti-Oedipus as well because like today we have this deterritorialized romantic social thing, right? So marriage is chosen for love for emotion as opposed to i think in the past marriage was more exclusively a political arrangement right yeah it was an arrangement amongst families exactly you know and that's why Deleuze and guattari say in the primitive territorial machine you've got these kind of you not only have the local lineages going on but you've got sort of the between the groups you've got the sort of loose patriarchal band of men who are arranging marriages and they say right. that this is why they kind of ascribe perversion to the primitive territorial machine because they say men are never more homosexual than when they are arranging marriages when they're kind of trading wives and right. whatnot but going but, back but, to the athenians from libidinal economy too there and I mean, the third term you might be looking for between or among alliance and affiliation is this notion of lineage, because it does have to do with with the political arrangements. And, you know, you you keep your mother open for, you know, you can't marry your mother, right, because you keep your mother open for the, the affiliative line, but you can't marry your sister because you keep her open for potential alliance with another family, right? So, like, this is the weird economy of incest that they kind of look at in right. chapter three you know you've got to be able to triangulate the uh oedipus down the line when we get to to capital when we get to social reproduction falling back on private familial reproduction etc and being reduced to it that's where oedipus crops up right, right yeah so. and i think that's so interesting because you know you think of something even like okay within game of thrones <laughs> robert baratheon the Baratheon line was like a distant – one of his ancestors was a bastard of the Targaryens. That's why he was chosen as the king because he still had that blood tie back to the original – the Targaryen dynasty. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was kind of interesting because I had never really thought about – you know, I guess we today sort of project back like our idea of marriage or like – relationships as this sort of romantic thing but you even look back to and Deleuze and Guattari do bring this up towards the end of the chapter relative to like the rat man and the wolf man and how the economics of the arrangement have a priority over like their personal feelings so I think I mix up the situations but I feel like maybe it was the wolf man in particular who had shared this like he fell in love with this woman he knew his father wouldn't allow the marriage to be it wasn't advantageous enough as this other woman, etc. You might be able to recall these things a little bit better, but I just thought. Well, that was I mean, the, I mean, this is the part where they say, you know, if you're going to do a dissertation on psychoanalysis, it's better to avoid big, generic, wide-ranging topics like psychoanalytic epistemology or, or whatever it may be, and rather focus on, say, the role of of maids or servant girls in Freud's theories, especially in his case histories. I mean, you see, as we've looked at Ratman and Wolfman, we see a prominence played to both, specifically even in the, in the beginning of the case histories, both of them have really detailed involvements with these servant girls and these sexual the sexual kind of like origin story of their childhood, which of course Freud is always trying to pin down, whether it be in the fantasy of the the wolves in the tree, right, and and the primal scene, whatever. But they suggest looking at you know with Wolfman, he's obsessed with these servant girls, right, and they question how Freud wants to reduce the servant girl on all fours to the mother in the primal scene being fucked from behind, doggy style, quote unquote, like a wolf or whatever, and how that that for them. This is the other way around where, you know, reducing the outside, the, the non-familial to the familial seems like a way of, of imposing the stranglehold of Oedipus when, in fact, the non-familial is always primary. And that's something that they, they argue. With the Rat Man, of course, we see the, we see a kind of inheritance, if you will, of unconsciousness from the father who himself had to choose between the rich woman and the poor woman that his family was trying to arrange for him and his right. father. And the rat man's father is doing the same thing that his father himself had to go through where there is the splitting, as they suggest, of the 
of sort of the loved object between sort of being funneled and forced into marrying for money or for status or prestige, as they say, rather than marrying for love, which is a kind of modern problematic, as you already brought out. I mean, Nietzsche himself writes on this, when marriage starts to be based more on love than on the negotiations of power based on family alliances, then can we even really call it marriage? Has the institution itself, does the institution itself need to fade away? Does does right. it not does it not transform? into something that it radically looks different from. And to a certain extent, Nietzsche poses a problem that capital and through, especially via Oedipus kind of answers. And it's like, well, no, uh, the family can just become even more sort of insular and quote unquote nuclear, right? As we like to say, the nuclear family, and it can still function as that social, you know, private territory of social reproduction in microcosm. And this is exactly what they're calling into question to a certain extent, or well, to a large extent, they're calling into question the the kind of explanatory power, that ideological form that the family holds, you know, this placeholder of reducing everything or filtering everything through the family primarily, which is what one of the main critiques of right. Freud and psychoanalysis hinges on is like, this is how they suggest, you know, Freud tries to neuroticize everything by reducing everything to mommy, daddy, me, et cetera. I mean, we've talked about this obviously before, but this is part of what they're suggesting in a certain theoretical, if yeah. not practical dissolution of the family form. Part of it is that the family is always already open to the outside and thinking otherwise or reversing the situation that somehow the family is is the active organizer rather than merely, as they say, the, the inductive stimuli for filtering the outside. You know, this kind of privilege or this kind of granting of autonomy to the family form taints not only patients like, you know, psychogenetic history, if you will, but hovers over the the sort of underpinning as they want to say, desiring production or desiring machines that are informing the the sort of inner workings of, you know, if you look at the rat man or the the wolf man, their their psychic life and their connection to sort of social collective life, their engagement with social production and reproduction is far more interesting than reducing it to these familial coordinates. And so I think that's, to get back to your point, that's where I think they turn to the role of the servant girl or the, um, or the, uh, it's not just the maid or the servant girl. There's a certain extent in which a lot of these women that they're referring to offhand in Freud's case histories, like with the old man, the rat man are also functioning as what Freud calls the mother's substitute. But I think that the, the important thing for Freud, right, is that he always wants to qualify this influx of desire towards the mother as also perhaps being the mother or her substitute. So these servant girls, these maids that have such a dynamic role in these case histories get reduced to being just imaginary doubles of the mother. And I think for, for Dulles and Guattari, this is problematic. Something else that's interesting that I just thought of relative to the rat man in particular is how that he you know he develops that sort of circular story about returning the money that can never be the circuit can never actually be fully completed so this is almost like this analogy for when capital becomes filative right because it, it's sort of this endless sort of such circuit that never really gets fulfilled it just that like that like closure at the end of the circuit whatever that is that would provide i guess what would it be like a, a finitude is left uncovered or whatever so that's how it continually you know works within displacing its internal limits or something like that i don't know just a just a thought there but another thing that i wanted to just bring up quickly was the i guess and i feel like this has been missed or like maybe this is just too banal of a point to even bring up relative to like these discussions of the abolition of family abolition for example what utility does a surname have other than this sort of legal juridical practice of the transmission of property amongst generations, etc. You know what I mean? You could say that there is also a transmission of prestige, which no transmission of money can always account for, even though today, perhaps, and in the time I'm thinking of in the sort of end of modernity, if you will, you know, even if the name as a means of transmitting prestige and sort of political power has diminished. It still kind of functions locally here and there. I'm thinking of 
you know, like Jay Gats turning his name to Gatsby in The Great Gatsby and how so much of the novel hinges on this question of the, the old money versus the nouveau riche and how that, you know, so much of Tom and Daisy's, you know, kind of struggle and disparagement of Gatsby from Tom's angle, at least, is this question of, you know, you may have more money than God, but your money can't buy you the prestige that the landed sort yeah. of, you know, the East egg can, can give you. So, yeah, I think that I would just add, and they say this early in the, in the book, I believe, but I would just add on top of your juridical inheritance sort of matrix, the prestige is another one of the flows, right? Yeah. This is interesting too, because another aspect that I've been noticing on this reread of uh, Song of Ice and Fire a lot is, is bastardy and how this is a very real political threat. Sons that don't have an official family last name, right? They're a threat to the political order because they sort of cont- there's a little bit more deterritorialization going on. It's an aspect of this transition from of the institution of marriage from this more solely political aspect towards a type of romantic coupling. Rather, the offspring of the romantic coupling are seen as you know they're called baseborn, etc. Like they're they're attainted, they're looked down morally, etc. Right? Like you can see this as a type of um like a type of coding, like a type of um human security system, et cetera, to sort of maintain a type of order, I guess, within the social or something like that. What's interesting about it is that the bastards are collectivized by region, right? So right. they're almost a collective subject. Jon Snow, what is it? Sand. Ramsey Snow. Yeah, and sand. The, so each region has its own sort of designated collective assemblage, if you will, of the bastards that all right. share this common name right this generic name that allows them to in a certain sense if they were to coalesce and form a revolutionary subject and to a certain extent there is some of this although it's individualized in someone like Jon Snow but you can imagine an alliance formed you know non-filiatively sort of uh, a union of bastards I mean that would uh, kind of be like the uh another aspect of this too would be the um the free folk the wildlings because they are sort of that right like they're <laughs> that's a good point yeah you know what i mean they're totally they're totally they're far more deterritorialized social group they don't kneel they call the people south of the wall kneelers they elect their kings things like that they don't have the same political alliances and i would just say that you know so much of the story centers around john snow right in finding that he has this lineage right that's been covered over and overcoated by the sort of collective laws. And so he redeems himself. But I think it's more interesting if you think about it in terms of the, uh, you know, when they talk about delirium as the direct investment of the libido in the socius, and they talk about how it's populated by races and ethnicity, yeah, which yeah, was yeah. Much describing this, they're talking about on the one hand, and this is why it's important, I, I think, to read chapter four first, when they talk about, you know, on the one hand, you've got this paranoid reactionary pole of the unconscious and the the sort of schizophrenizing the schizophrenic revolutionary pole for them they see in someone like Arto or in Nijinsky or in a number of the authors that they mention right there there is this movement on the one hand to claim Aryan blood pure blood or the blood of the ascendant and the and the supreme in order to cast oneself as an Aryan or as uh whatever it may be as sort of of the elect or the chosen one versus inheriting the inferior races for all time of a what is it of a black a jew a beast something like that that arto goes into and that it's the it's always on this fascistizing side the paranoid side whereby one wants to claim a kind of purity of blood and this is why i mentioned before the show started i was interested in, in one of the last times they bring up schraber right because they begin the book with schraber and almost end it with schraber in the past in the last 10 pages where they say we can't go along with one of lacan's disciples i believe it's monani manoni when she says oh there is this kind of progressive 1902 marks this progressive move whereby psychoanalysis has granted a kind of 
opening or break from these juridical legal institutions that constitutes progress because Schraber is let out, let out of the asylum on his own recognizance. And the Liz and Guattari are like, we can't agree with this because he wouldn't have been let out if he wasn't able to, you know, conform to the interests of the sort of ruling social class in Austria if he if he wasn't already sort of thinking along these lines of race of claiming this Aryan descent of being able to control his and manage his monetary flows etc cetera, etc cetera. so like they're kind of saying if he were if he were really following these lines of flight of this of the schizophrenic pole right of the schizophrenic process rather than this paranoiac side which freud completely whitewashes as we know and we've talked about with santner and we've discussed with the listen to read you know of all of the racial not just undertones but forefronts foregrounding of schraber's delirium if all of that wasn't implicated in him sort of saying like of course i'm an elected one of course god you know may not talk to other living beings but i'm one of the great ones that he does interact with and i have this aryan blood blah 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 if none of that were true and as they say if he weren't a paranoiac but a schizophrenic he would have never been let out so you can't really call this progress when, you know, there's nothing quite revolutionary or threatening in Schraber's being released. I guess that would be maybe a, a good way to get into. And if you disagree, let me know. But maybe talking about a little bit, because I think they opened the section with this discussion of kind of the the signifying chain and how it sort of flows over the body without organs and is, I guess, a type of provides a type of structure, etc., this could go back to names of the father as well for Lacan to provide that sort of. I could read this one about the this quote about the chain. This, which I'm assuming, like I said, is a signifying chain. The chain is like the apparatus of transmission or of reproduction in the desiring machine. The desiring machine is inseparable both from the distribution of the partial objects on the body without organs and from the leveling effect exerted on the partial objects by the body without organs, which results in appropriation. The disjunctive synthesis of recording seemed to follow after the connective synthesis of production, with the part of the energy of production, libido, being converted into a recording energy, Newman. So this is what I was kind of mentioning earlier with the production kind of developing first, and then the system of inscription or marking or something like coming later on. I'm not sure what page is that's on, but you know, I know that they they kind of repeat that the signifying chain for them itself is not made up of is made up of non-signifying elements which is perhaps paradoxical or counterintuitive or at least counter to this this sort of way in which we normally think of lacan's signifying chain is composed of signifiers and signifier represents the subject for another signifier blah 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 you know for for Guattari and for Deleuze right when they're talking about the chain here in relation to desiring production you know for them it's composed of these molecular elements that are themselves non-signifying or asignifying so so yeah and and then you know in terms of i mean it is interesting that for them the production of production the production of recording the production of consumption to a certain extent that itself forms a kind of circle in which you know it's hard to say that it's not simultaneous, right? That the production of production is immediately production of recording, et cetera, which is kind of interesting, right? So it's not necessarily that the libido is is first, but that these transformations of energy are ongoing, uh, you know, and, you know, the production of production needs already this kind of recording surface that falls back on it and appropriates it as the body without organs, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this is just kind of not necessarily important for this chapter, but just just to refresh some of the some of the things they argue along the way leading up to this this finality. I don't even know if you should bring this up now, but I was just thinking about since they did mention here the body without organs, I was thinking like, OK, so the body without organs is the limit of the social or the socius. Is that right? Yeah. Capitalism is the limit to what? I thought capitalism was the right. Don't they say something like about cap? I thought capital was the exterior limit to the social. 
It's the difference between the exterior limit and the absolute limit. I have to look this up because this is where sometimes they're uh, inconsistent. Um, I think sometimes they will insist upon discussing these things as though it's the most important where it, <laughs> I think it falls out at a certain point. Let me just look. Oedipus is a limit, but limit has many different meanings. <laughs> course since it can be at the beginning as an inaugural event in the role of a matrix or in the middle as a structural function ensuring the mediation of personages and the ground of their relations or at the end as an eschatological determination now we've seen that is only in this last sense that oedipus is a limit this is also the case for desiring production but in fact this last sense itself can be understood in many different ways in the first place desiring production is situated at the limits of social production the decoded flows at the limits of the codes and the territoriality the body without organs at the limits of the socius. So this is kind of how you phrased it, but let me go on just a little bit. Sure. We shall speak of an absolute limit every time the schizo flows pass through the wall, scramble all the codes, and deterritorialize the socius. The body without organs is the deterritorialized socius, the wilderness where the decoded flows run free, the end of the world, the apocalypse. Secondly, however, the relative limit is no more nor less than the capitalist social formation. Okay, gotcha. Because the latter engineers and mobilizes flows that are effectively decoded, but does so by substituting for the codes of quantifying axiomatic that is even more oppressive, with the result that capitalism in conformity with the movement by which it counteracts its own tendency is continually drawing near the wall while at the same time pushing the wall further away. Schizophrenia is the absolute limit, but capitalism is the relative limit. And then, you know, I could go on. <laughs> what I wanted to pose yeah. here was kind of my idea was that there's a really kind of a throwaway quote on, let's see, I can even, 358, midway through the page, really short sentence. There is only the social and the metaphysical. What I want to say is the body without organs is like this hinge point between the social and the metaphysical, kind of based on this limit, this kind of limit that they argue what do you think about that? I mean, I, I like that. As you said, you said a hinge point. You know, some type of like, I don't know yeah. if it's the fold or what suture point or quilting point, you know, something like that. You know, I don't know. It just that manifest boundary or. And just to give the context, because I do think the beginning of the, the paragraph is important just to situate just for the sure. listener. When they say there is only the social and the metaphysical, this is them. This is one of the refrains that they've had since the beginning of the book whereby you know there is desire in the social and nothing else this is something they say earlier right so they say it is indeed true that the social and the metaphysical arrive at the same time in accordance with the two simultaneous meanings of process as the historical process of social production and as the metaphysical process of desiring production but they did not come afterward the factors of production are always actual quote unquote and are so from the tenderest age, right, of the child, as they're suggesting. Actual does not signify recent as opposed to infantile, but rather an inaction as opposed to what is virtual and will come about under certain conditions. Oedipus is virtual and reactional, right? Blah, 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 where they talk about. But I mean, for them, when they said there's desire in the social and nothing else, this is kind of like them saying there is the social and the metaphysical. And I think that, you know, you can they talk about this in other ways like when they say you know technical machines and desiring machines are the same except under different regimes we've talked about this before with the clock the clock is a technical machine machine for subdividing the units of time and measuring providing a metrics for the division of time and the division of the day but it's also a way of coordinating the workday from quote unquote the part of rest the clock itself has a technical aspect but it's always already in conjunction with this desiring application of sort of demarcating the workday that's part of this refrain i think it's interesting though to call desire metaphysical yeah and, and perhaps desiring machines in particular metaphysical right perhaps what that might mean and i think that Besides going into parsing out what metaphysical means sort of in the history of philosophy, right, with Aristotle's metaphysics as a kind of weird label that's appended to the book that comes after the physics, right? And so in and of itself, it already has this definition that can be deconstructed. There is this sense, I think, for them in which 
to a certain extent, if, if I'm going to be, and I, I'm willing to be wrong here, but my gut or my sort of intuition or my whatever, but when they talk about designing machines, they're not necessarily talking about physical apparatuses, at least when they are focusing on desire machines, qua desiring machines, right? And insofar as desiring machines are desiring machines, under the regime of desire, we are not talking about physical machines. Do you agree with me on that? I guess. Does that, um, does that well, make sense? I mean, this is a, a huge question. This question can't even be quantified, but it's something that this discussion, I think, primarily of the body without organs has brought up in my head is okay what what the fuck animates the organic what animates the body what actually gets the fucking body to move and i think perhaps that is where you know that's wrapped up in that question is is that question of the metaphysical where's the energy coming from to move that body we were already talking about that with uh with the libido of you know the um... but is libido like a metaphysical force or like Digging into that kind of shit, I think, is kind of interesting because here, while I'm thinking about it, I'm just going to throw this out here, too, because I can't get over this image of like thinking about the way that they counterpose the body without organs and the partial objects and say, OK, the body without organs is alongside the partial objects, but which means, which means it doesn't unify or totalize them. Correct. Yeah, exactly. So I always go to this image of of the mummy, right? Because the mummy is the hollow body, literally a body without organs, but the organs are stored in the canopic jars. I think there's like six jars, right, that the organs are stored in. So the mummy and the body, I mean, the organs, although they are physically removed, right, they're still part of the body, if that makes, you know what I mean? You can't have the mummy without, I. if you take away either of those, you're sort of losing something. Right. Does that makes sense. They sit alongside one another. If you try to put the organs back in the body, it's not going to move. It's not going to come back to life either. You know what I mean? Right. But, but, but you it, can't like reconstitute this whole, I think, is the way that they describe it by like right, because really smashing these two things back yeah. together. I don't know. I think that's kind of interesting, right? Because the physical body remains, but it's not animated. There's no motion. But the whole idea behind preserving those organs is that they are essential to the navigation of the afterworld. Right. So the metaphysical angle of the body without organs, that's getting beyond my, you know, beyond no, my but, no, no, but I think that that gets to the heart of it, right? Because the mummy can't be understood. The mummy and the organs separate and alongside one another can't be understood in the merely physical, actual world, right? In the yeah, world. There, there has the to living. be a virtual. There is a world in which there's a the, world where they can become this. Uh, th those organs are necessary for new participation. Vessel. Yeah. yeah. That's precisely the idea. I mean, think right? about creating a new body for a new body of the, a new earth, right? And so I think the part of it to get to kind of circle back around is like when they talk about the body without organs, they're not necessarily talking about a physical body. Yeah. And right. I think this, this is one of the ways in which the notion of socius is important because the socius, while not unifying or totalizing the components of which which compose it, whether it be the territory of the primitive territorial machine or the despot himself, to a certain extent, right, with the king has the king's two bodies, we're not necessarily, insofar as we're considering the despot as, you know, as the despotic body without organs, we're not necessarily thinking of the despot's physical body. Right. right. We're, th we're thinking yeah. of the despot qua transcendental phallus or whatever the fuck. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Through which the, through which the flows are coordinated. Precisely. The, so, I mean, the, the flows themselves, to a certain extent, can be thought about and even qualified and quantified in ter in ways that rarefy them or remove them from their physical constraints. But on the other hand, they are indexes indices they are indicators of physical phenomena right you know it's they talk about nomads following the the flows of herds or the flows of water or etc cetera, etc cetera, right so to a certain extent flows have there's something nice about notions of flows and breaks insofar as they can be abstracted from their physical embodiments and talked about in a way 
that sometimes can seem perhaps idealist or too removed, but in fact, they are embodied in physical coordinates, just like the body yeah. without organs is not itself a physical phenomenon, but it conceptually is a way of talking about right. It's the same with capital, right? Relations, so, relationships of flows, quanta of energy. All yeah, means of production, things. relations of production, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, I mean, the syntheses, effectively, yeah, and, at the and end so of the when, day, right? When you talk about like what's animating the body of our organs, we get back to libido of connection production, right? We get back to Newman of recording. We get back to Voluptus of consummation consumption well, like, yeah and Human all of these all of these are surface tension energies of the you know the phenomena of which they are you know the correlate if you will right so in that sense i mean freud always had this interesting question right because he almost and this is perhaps one of lacan's ways of maybe moving away from the notion of libido as constant force because when freud's trying to think about drives right and he's thinking about it in terms of exerting a pressure right right yeah it's a constant force it's exerting a pressure blah 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 you know it has an aim it has a source etc but so much of what freud is trying to do is both physicalize drive and locate it in biology but on the other hand say like psychoanalysis can't really tell us about that that's biology's domain right. to tell us about the source of the drives etc so and this is why i think like with the con and then like the slovenian school when they talk about desire and drive so much of it is de-physicalized because embodying because trying to quantify libido trying to quantify drive in terms of a physical metric Right. Is, like Reich, Orgon, etc. Yeah, that's a perfect example that leads down this light of flight that may be productive and, and creative and even maybe more on the domain of art than science and pushes our boundaries of what we think divides the physical and the metaphysical, etc. But to a certain extent, as we know, those experiments failed, even if there is an intuition under them that's interesting for the cause of science. On the other hand, perhaps trying to think about orgone as this physical embodiment that can be measured leads us to these quandaries and these aporias that yeah the kind of fucks with us so yeah i think when they qualify desire as metaphysical this is why i was saying desiring machines from the aspect of desiring machines are not themselves physical right yeah and trying to think about them as physical we need to think about we need a shift regime as I think they would say, right? So this is why I think what's hard is for them, they want to collapse an infrastructure, superstructure differentiation and want to say that desire is infuses the infrastructure when the classical way of thinking about it, one of the classical ways of thinking about it would be like the physical is the infrastructure, whether it be economics or whatever. And then the, the superstructure is ideology, right? politics, art, blah, blah, right. blah. Yeah. And, and I think this is another reason why I think they want to reject the notion of ideology as as a kind of a red herring or... Insufficiency of it. Yeah, where's the... Okay, and I'll, I'll give this back to you. I just want to read this. this no, really go ahead. Quick, this really no, this quick. is just, good. I'm glad you... This is definitely something I wanted to cover, so... Just on the subject of ideology, just to clarify this radical move, maybe not so radical anymore, but this, this move that they make of collapsing the distinction of the emperor and the super and you know the base and superstructure this is 344 at the bottom where they're they're talking about pre-conscious investments unconscious the pre-conscious investments of interest unconscious investments of desire yada yada i mean all of this is really good and we mentioned this earlier but it's, it's kind of coming back up they say this situation is not at all adequate for resolving the following problem. Why do many of those who have or should have an objective revolutionary interest maintain a pre-conscious investment of a reactionary type? And more rarely, how do certain people whose interest is objectively reactionary come to affect a pre-conscious revolutionary investment? Must we invoke in the one case a thirst for justice, a just ideological position, as well as a correct and just view. And in the other case of blindness, the result of an ideological deception or mystification, revolutionaries often forget or do not like to recognize that one wants and makes revolution out of desire, not duty. Here is elsewhere, the concept of ideology is an execrable concept that hides the real problems, which are always of an organizational nature. 
If Reich, at the very moment he raised the most profound of questions, why did the masses desire fascism, was content to answer by invoking the ideological, the subjective, the irrational, the negative, and the inhibited, it was because he remained the prisoner of derived concepts that made him fall short of the materialist psychiatry he dreamed of that prevented him from seeing how desire was part of the infrastructure and that confined him in the duality of the objective and the subjective. Consequently, psychoanalysis was consigned to the analysis of the subjective as defined by ideology. But everything is objective or subjective as one wishes. That is not the distinction. The distinction to be made passes into the economic infrastructure itself and into its investments. Libidinal economy is no less objective than political economy, and the political no less subjective than the libidinal, even though the two correspond to two modes of different investments of the same reality as social reality. There is an unconscious libidinal investment of desire that does not necessarily coincide with the pre-conscious investments of interest, and that explains how the latter can be perturbed and perverted in the most somber organization below all ideology. That kind of recapitulated a little bit what we're talking about, but it opens up some some new avenues for discussion. And a bit of the passage that jumps out is des- desire is what drives revolution, not duty. Revolutionaries often forget or like do not like to recognize that one wants and makes revolution out of desire, not duty. You know, it's funny. That, and God, you're going to hate me for this. But I was just thinking there's a quote from Game of Thrones where they tell Jon Snow, love is the death of duty. <laughs> Such an interesting little side note, but you know, all this discussion of the body without organs and the conceptually, I know that they don't want this like representation or like these metaphors, but that's where my head like automatically goes in thinking of the concept of the body without organs being the Colossus of Rhodes or whatever, and like kind of being, and again, being that sort of space between two, like the metaphysical and, and the social for example. But I was also thinking about, and going back to like this question of orgon animation, dead bodies, mummies, bodies without organs is another quote that they bring up that I quite like was about about Christianity being a motley of everything that's been believed and kind of yeah. how that, that can be like analogous to capitalism being this motley beast like a frankenstein monster of all the social eyes from this social whatever from this one you know what i mean it's kind of like this motley thing that gets constructed and then animates and turns against its (laughs) its is it is it is it marx that they're kind of quoting and 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 rearranging that capitalism is well i'm thinking this, this goes back to oedipus but i was thinking to christianity as well and what are the two commandments? Love your neighbor and obey your mother and father. Well, there's ten commandments, but I'm not sure. Which well, yeah, but I mean, two. these are yeah, there are the original ten, but in in the New Testament, I can't remember. I'd have to look up the text, but Christ says specifically there are only the two most important commandments are to love your neighbor and to honor your mother and father. Well, it's love your neighbor as yourself, right? Which is something that Freud himself kind of draws back from and is like, oh. And I mean, even, we can circle a bit around to that later, but it, I think this question of the image of the motley it's the, it's a, assemblage of everything that's ever been believed. They don't use assemblage, but it's something fewer, like that. Fewer and fewer people believe in all this, but it makes no difference since capitalism is like the Christian religion. It lives precisely from a lack of belief. It does not need it. A motley painting of all that has been believed. The commandment to honor your father and your mother is kind of cast aside at some point, right, where... You know, Jesus kind of tells us that we'll have to disregard our our brothers, our our family, when it comes down to um, to following the the sort of new covenant, if you will. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But yeah, a motley painting of all that's been believed. Yeah, that's I believe they're repurposing Marx's quote about capitalism in order to ground their idea about the axiomatic right that sort of is able to repurpose all the codes right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and overcodes and sort of uh, dole out little axioms for for any one specific investment. But yeah, I mean... What does the Frankenstein monster want? What is its request from the doctor is to create a bride so that it can have love, but also you wonder if it's like the machine has to use the organic to reproduce itself, if that makes sense, like capital using human stock to reproduce its own reproduction so much of the pain itself of frankenstein is this abandonment issue being abandoned by your by your father yeah 
I thought vampires are something interesting too because like it's a it's a dead body, but they still require blood to move to live. So they're at this liminal space of being dead, but not but not dead. Yeah, dead, that's but why not I'm... dead. They're still animated by desire for blood, which is I think at least canonically is kind of like this. There's a sexual libidinal aspect to the vampire that I think I don't know if that's a more classical aspect of the stories if that's more of a a more modern aspect of it because i think even marx right he kind of draws on these very gothic images of of vampires the bourgeoisie sort of siphoning the vampire can be a image of siphoning surplus value from the workers etc i mean that's capital capital itself is is vampire like but just think about this in terms of death and the body without organs the death drive this idea of the of all the intensities on the body without organs equaling zero and how that relates to a catatonia, et cetera. Yeah, there is the catatonic when there is a zero intensity on the body without organs, but that's kind of for them, one of the outcomes of taking the schizophrenic as an entity through medical knowledge, the schizophrenic qua, you know, asylum entity is one of the outcomes is the catatonic right this is why they in the last few pages they kind of address some of the misunderstandings and the bad readings that may that may come up from reading this which of course did come one of them specifically was that you know laughing and then that the schizophrenic is uh is the revolutionary and they were like you know this is one of the problems with qualifying schizophrenia as a process, which is a refrain throughout the mm-hmm. the book, rather than thinking of the schizophrenic specifically as being a revolutionary subject, or vice versa, that the revolutionary has to be schizophrenic in any sort of individual egoic way. Yeah, because I think basically the paradigm is if you're thinking at the level of conscious desire and revolution, you're already you're not you're not on the right track. Even that notion of conscious desire i think they would say is more akin to what they're calling interest right pre-conscious yeah yeah, interest. yeah 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 so yeah you're right in, in that notion of of conscious desire there is a kind of contradiction in terms at least in their mode of framing the issue while you situate yourself i just think it's nice to read this little bit because i think at the end of the of our discussion of anti Oedipus, we would be remiss not to bring up their kind of warning in the last few pages. Those who have read us this far will perhaps find many reasons for reproaching us. That's not only for you and me, the readers, but the audience listening to us talk about this shit. So those of us who read this far will perhaps find many reasons for reproaching us, for believing too much in the pure potentialities of art and even of science, for denying or minimizing the role of classes and class struggle. And one could think of Ray Brazier, for example, Mm -hmm. here and his distaste for anti for militating in <laughs> favor of an irrationalism of desire, for identifying the revolutionary with the schizo, for falling into familiar, all too familiar traps. This would be a bad reading, and we don't know which is better, a bad reading or no reading at all. And in probability, there are far more serious approaches to be made, which we haven't even thought of. As for those we have named, we hold in the first place that art and science have a revolutionary potential and nothing more, and that this potential appears all the more as one is less and less concerned with what art and science mean from the standpoint of a signifier or signifieds that are necessarily reserved for specialists, but that art and science cause increasingly decoded and deterritorialized flows to circulate in the socius, flows that are perceptible to everyone, which force the social axiomatic to grow ever more complicated, to become more saturated, to the point where the scientists and the artists may be determined to rejoin an objective revolutionary situation in reaction against authoritarian designs of a state that is incompetent and above all castrating by nature. For the state imposes a specifically artistic Oedipus, a specifically scientific Oedipus. And I think that the stuff about art and science, I think when they are, if you will, allowed to pursue their process, which is not about achieving end goals for a current state of affairs, like if, say, art under Soviet Russia with its type of realism, its socialist realism, if you will, which is serving kind of as propaganda or ways of aggrandizing a political order, or, you know, when science is not allowed to continue its process of of sort of, you know, 
searching and experimenting in ways in which it's not benefiting capital, c- commodities, et cetera, et cetera, when it's allowed to do what its essence is purported to be, that's when it can affect these. That's when it can scramble the axiomatics or push the, you know, push it further to complicating itself when it's not sort of trying to resurrect an old body or to invest in a particular form of sovereignty or power, the powers that be when it's allowed to sort of, sort of, you know, continue its process unabated without having a goal or without sort of being um, siphoned off. I mean, that's when I think that they think too, this is the schizophrenic aspect itself of capitalism, right? I think this is where they stay kind of close to Marx when they say capital gives us weapons if they're not already siphoned into the channels that are for sort of shoring up power. If the schizophrenic process of capital is is taken to a way to break through the walls rather than break down at, at these the limit that capital is sort of straining towards, but pushing away with its axiomatic, you know, that's when we can, we can have, or we can try to follow or try to start up or keep going or, or plug into the revolutionary machine and the art machine and the science machine and the analytic machine. That's how you can get those machines kind of humming along together with, you know, the metaphysical design machines, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of interesting, just really quickly, that for them, it's not enough to say, like, liberate sexuality, liberate desire. They actually say a bunch. Yeah, they have here. a really good passage about how sexual liberation isn't enough. Well, it's not enough if, if, one is al- if one is always already sort of still within or still repurposing or recreating these Oedipal, right. neurotic, yeah, narcissistic... Yeah patriarchal we should forms. read that passage because there's something about like homosexual liberation like that quote do you know what i'm talking about i'm sure i can find it too i know i pulled that but i think the same would go for desire and the liberation of desire for them it's not necessarily about liberating desire it's the question of whether or not desiring production is subordinated and subjected to a sort of pre-given or already constituted form of power and sovereignty I found okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No gay liberation movement is possible as long as homosexuality is caught up in a relation of exclusive disjunction with heterosexuality, a relation that ascribes them both to a common Oedipal and castrating stock, charged with ensuring only their differentiation in two non-communicating series, instead of bringing to light their reciprocal inclusion and their transverse communication in the decoded flows of desire. I think this is somewhat of, just to anticipate This is somewhat of a little bit of what we were talking about with Michael Hart last week about intersectionality. Yeah. And that to a certain extent, one one cannot be anti-capitalist and homophobic or transphobic or et cetera, et cetera, at the same time. One and I think here for them, one can't be anti-capitalist and pro-Oedipus at the same time, right? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I think that this is part of their way of framing it because for them Oedipus isn't just about sexuality it is also as as I mentioned earlier with Arto and Schraber it is also about white supremacy or supremacy of any kind right racial supremacy so it has imperialist and colonialist aspects to it too right where they they said a couple hundred pages back Oedipus is our own sort of private colony right so anti-imperialist struggles anti-colonialist struggles anti-patriarchal struggles, anti-heteronormative struggles, right? And then even uh, the, the the more recent struggles, which we kind of talked about with um, Leon Brenner and others, I'm trying to remember who, but off the top of my head, Leon comes to mind with, you know, sort of championing or sort of struggles, let's say struggles against a certain form of ableism, which isn't just related to the body, but also related to a kind of normativization of neurotypical, right? So there's a neurodiversity aspect to this too, that you find, I think, pretty strongly in anti oedipus even if they don't use this language of ableism and whatnot, their sort of castigation of Freud as, you know, the cure is neuroticizing everyone and then making 
the cure interminable. So you've always got clients for them. I think that's kind of a, a catch all phrase of thinking about their, um, their struggle against the quote unquote neurotypical psychoanalytic patient as being the, the neurotic, right? So you see all these struggles that for them, Oedipus encapsulates. It's not just sexuality, but that sexuality is it's definitely among them. There's a couple of things. I mean, I'm glad you brought up this class component because I do want to delve into that because I think that's something that gets overlooked or obscured in the text. But also, they clearly even say here to the people that think that this is anti-Lacan, like they praise Lacan for schizophrenizing analysis itself. They literally, within the text, say that precise thing. Obviously, I brought that up a number of times relative to Guattari and like the machinic ah and like how the object ah is one way in which that actually comes to fruition that we see Lacan kind of like going the schizophrenizing direction relative to analysis. But you know, that was just a kind of anecdotal thing that I wanted to mention. I'm going to go ahead. I want to read this little bit about class. A class is defined by a regime of syntheses, a state of global connections, exclusive disjunctions, and residual conjunctions that characterize the aggregate being considered. Membership in a class refers to the role in production or anti-production, to the place in the inscription, to the portion that is due to the subjects. The pre-conscious class interest itself thus refers to the selections of flows, to the detachments of codes, to the subjective remains or revenues. And from this viewpoint, it is indeed true that an aggregate comprises practically only a single class, the class which has an interest in a given regime. The other class can constitute itself only by a counter-investment that creates its own interest in terms of new social aims, new organs and means, a new possible state of social syntheses. Whence the necessity for the other class to be represented by a party apparatus that assigns these aims and means and affects a revolutionary break in the preconscious domain, the Leninist break, for example. What is interesting about that, though, is... You know, if you follow their logic further, they are a little bit wary with this idea that then the the solution is to be found in parties. Again, to just go back to what Michael Hart said last week, which will be out before this episode, if by party one means that which is attached to a vanguard, that which is hierarchized and centralized, et cetera, et cetera, then that's not a good model for what he thinks parties could be and i think that you you could say that just you know without necessarily having to reproduce their arguments you could say something similar with Deleuze and Guattari who by this time would have been obviously disenchanted with the French Communist Party and i know that at this time Guattari was still kind of jumping around looking for whether it be a Trotskyist variant or even at you know at a certain point getting tired of that he was still actively militant and whatever but there is a, a way in which they are not necessarily saying, okay, so now we need to create a, a party of desire or whatever, right? Like, I think that that's for them too simple of a of a solution. And I think for them, the, par- the problem with the party is that if it gets too involved in, or the classical party, let's just say, it's too involved with foregrounding the pre-conscious interests of class and already seems to subjugate the unconscious investments of desire and desiring production, and thereby it merely kind of reproduces the subjugated groups, if you will, that they are trying to steer us away from, or at least show us ways in which subjugated groups can find means of articulating their collective assemblages of enunciation in ways that they become subject groups. And when we have subject groups Perhaps one of the ways in which subject groups can easily fall back into subjugated groups is by coalescing around a party with its centralization, hierarchization, its kind of molar aggregate. It's more of this molar kind of structure. And I think that perhaps that's why Hart says maybe party is not so bad if we are considering multiplicities and multitudes as being on the other side of class as a molar concept. So, you know... This is why in A Thousand Plateaus, they will talk about this intersectionality of classes and masses, which we don't really have here, but we can already kind of anticipate with their discussion of molar statistical large aggregates and the molecular multiplicities that inform them. We'll leave that aside and and just, I just wanted to say that 
it seemed like that quote you read might have said like, oh, well, we just need a, we need a new. Yeah. It, it did sound we, like a traditional, like, I guess, class struggle based framework well, they, of like. They're not, the, against, they're not against class struggle, just the party. I meant that they, they seem to be saying we need a new party of desire or whatever. But go yeah, on. Sorry. I knew. Yeah. Cause it does seem like they kind of, they do hit on the kind of class distinction and like, this would be like these produces these counter desires to. But I don't know, that's so confusing because they say, don't they previously say within this book that there's only one class and it's the bourgeoisie? They say that, that there's only one class and that they kind of say that here in the quote you just read, right? That the class that's the bourgeoisie or the class that's in power is the one in which they're in one of which if there is the out class, as they call it, right? Like the outlaw or whatever, the whore class, this outside class. For them, they're trying to say that There's one class because that class is benefiting from the investments of interest and that, and that in fact, one needs this counter investment in order for their, for the quote unquote other class to be able to articulate. So I think in that sense, there is a, you know, in the Hegelian Marxist way, we might say that's where the contradiction plays out, but I think they're trying to avoid that notion of a dialectical negation going on or that the outclass in counter investing is reacting to again to bring up michael hart it's kind of like in his articulation of foucault that resistance is primary rather than secondary and reactionary they said something about well, while, while you're looking let me read this yeah again, go ahead just please to, do to emphasize this a bit the other class can constitute itself only by oh no hold on went too far and from this viewpoint it is it is indeed true that an aggregate comprises practically only a single class that class which has an interest in a given regime the other class can constitute itself only by a counter investment that creates its own interest in terms of new social aims new organs and means a new possible state of social syntheses which is interesting because they say that the bourgeoisie is the decoding class too and I think that, that that's close to kind of how Marx talks about them. He may not, he doesn't use the term decoding, but he describes the bourgeoisie and if you want to say capital itself as providing the means by which to overthrow, undo the, right. um, in critiquing capital and wanting to go beyond it, we don't necessarily want to go beyond in the other direction back to feudal society with its types of oppression and domination. Right. And right. So I think that that's why for Marx, the bourgeoisie itself was important as this means of overthrowing, let's just call it more despotic forms of social organization. That doesn't necessarily mean they're the good guy, but right. that this, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Things, are, these things are always are, they're complicated, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, to go back to, you know, we're discussing the Dothraki and I mean, you brought up how like, sure, like there's a certain, they have this kind of gift economy. But there's a very, you know, it's a very rigid patriarchal society, etc. So going back to that social really isn't, you know, I mean, it's still, you're still caught up in a problematic arrangement, I suppose. This is 355. I mean, they're kind of, they're kind of talking about Oedipus here. And um, they say, there is no family, there is no family where vacuoles are not arranged and where extra familial breaks are not manifest by means of which the libido is engulfed in order to sexually invest the non-familial, i.e. the other class as determined under the empirical rubrics of the quote-unquote richest and the poorest, and sometimes both at once. Wouldn't the great other, or Lacan they're saying here, wouldn't the big other, indispensable to the position of desire be the social other. Social difference apprehended and invested as the non-family within the family itself, which is kind of like a social way of thinking about extimacy, right? The the other that's more internal than my inner self or whatever the fuck, right? The other class is by no means grasped by the libido as a magnified or impoverished image of the mother, but as the foreign, the non-mother, the non-father, the non-family, the index of what is non-human insects and without which the libido would not assemble its desiring machines. Class struggle goes to the heart of the ordeal of desire. And I could go on. No, I'm um, glad you brought this up because it also makes me think about that. Lost my train of thought, I think, but it was something in there about, um, like what page is that on? 
This is at the bottom of 354, top of 355. What's difficult is that when we read some of the stuff about when they have said, you know, there is this one class, it's the bourgeoisie, they're the ones that are benefiting from the investments, the sort of interests, and you have to have counter investments, blah, 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 from the other class. I think this is part of where they can come off, as they said, too, you know, perhaps we didn't say enough about class struggle, blah, blah, blah. And this is, I think, why Ray is, you know, right to have some concerns about the book. But when they say something like class struggle goes to the heart of the ordeal of desire. I mean, I think that that's where things are just, they're just very complicated, right? I think that for them, it's not about necessarily doing away with class struggle as though that would help, right? As though there's something wrong with class struggle inherently. I just think that their way of articulating the animating factors and the underlying determinations at play means that for them- I mean, desire, I mean, what is it? Revolution- being associated with desire and not duty. I mean, I think yeah. that really goes to the yeah. heart of the argument, but I'm sorry for interrupting you there. I was basically just saying that for them, I think situating class struggle only on the level of class keeps us on the pre-conscious investments of interest and covers over or obscures the underlying unconscious investments of desire. And I think that's why Class struggle is still important and goes to the ordeal of desire. But if we only stay on the level of class as a molar entity, then okay. we we miss a lot of what's going on. I think Michael Hart's trying to do something similar with, with yeah. Antonio Negri by talking about this move from class to multitude to class prime. Right. Right. That when we when we get back to class at class prime, it's not the same class from that aspect. Yeah. And I think there's something. I think there's there's something, if not analogous, there's something resonant with what Michael Hart's articulating there in his essay on Empire 28 Years yeah. On and what Deleuze and Guattari are trying to do with the notion of class, class struggle by saying that we have to move beyond merely thinking in terms of class or party or really we're never going to... Um, yeah, that's like the ultimate argument of the whole anti-Oedipus is like there's if you're revolutionary whatever is still caught up in the Oedipal in the family and that sort of structure right. of like the hierarchical whatever elite party leader etc you're going to keep reproducing that that's part of the apparatus is that's a sort of requisite part of the capitalist machinery is that social vibe let's say <laughs> if you don't have anything to add relative to here cause, i mean i think this is a good topic to spend a lot of time on but i was just kind of curious what they mean about non-human sex here because i think in the in the passages there's some discussion of going back to i think what did they use the bumblebee and the clover yes uh, the what the bumblebee and the red clover right yeah the wasp and the orchid uh, precisely a parallel evolution as they call it in a thousand plateaus you know where they i was just trying to understand this in the context of i guess the human i mean the best thing i could think of was something like if i'm trying to woo someone and i give them flowers that's almost like (laughs) you know what i mean i don't know that was kind of a weak tenuous example of kind of what i thought they were gesturing towards but does that make sense you know what i mean because like the way that going back to ethology and you know the bird of paradise for example they they do that whole you know this territorialization where they clean out this area they do a little dance to attract their mate etc oh right yeah so in that way it's like they're just part of this greater like assemblage of or this greater whatever machine the body of the earth i don't know (laughs) the non-human sex or the non-anthropomorphic representation of sex this gets back to we only touched on it last time because it's in the passages from the first part of chapter four where they're talking about the phallus Right. And this gets back to your point about gay liberation as this exclusive disjunction of heterosexuality and homosexuality. Right. Or one could say this a way of thinking about humans as exclusively, whether it be heterosexual, homosexual or exclusively male or female. Right. This is why Freud gets from fleece this idea that he needs to start seeing his individual patients as comprising at the very least, or he needs to think of human sexuality at the very least in the terms of the couple 
uh, is comprising four sexes or four individuals, right? That yeah. the, the constitutive bisexuality, not in terms of object relation, but in terms of, um, let's just say, Lacan might say the masculine feminine positions, there's no one subject or person who's going to exclusively be on the masculine right. or the feminine side. Anyway, so they're, they're talking about phallus. And must it not also be said that the phallus is not one sex, but sexuality in its entirety, which is to say the sign of the large aggregate invested by the libido, whence the two sexes necessarily derive, both in their separation, the two homosexual series of man and man, woman and woman, and in their statistical relations within this aggregate. If you remember, they kind of talked about Proust earlier in the book where, you know, we're all, in a molar sense, we're all heterosexual, in a statistical sense, we're all homosexual, and in a... And in a more dynamic and vibrant sense, we're all sort of transsexual, right? So they go on and say, but Marx says something even more mysterious, that the true difference is not the difference between the two sexes, but the difference between the human sex and the non-human sex. It is clearly not a question of animals nor of animal sexuality. Something quite different is involved. If sexuality is the unconscious investment of the large molar aggregates, it is because on its other side, sexuality is identical with the interplay of the molecular elements that constitute these aggregates under determinate conditions. The dwarfism of desire as a correlate to its gigantism. I think they're using an analogy here in the micrological molecular aspect versus the large aggregates. Uh, for example, class as a large aggregate we were talking yeah. about. Sexuality and the desiring machines are one and the same inasmuch as these machines are present and operating in the social machines in their field, their formation, their functioning. Desiring machines are the non-human sex, the molecular machinic elements, their arrangements and their syntheses, without which there would be neither a human sex specifically determined in the large aggregates nor human sexuality capable of investing these aggregates. In a few sentences, Marx, who is nonetheless so miserly and reticent where sexuality is concerned, exploded something that will hold Freud and all of psychoanalysis forever captive, the anthropomorphic representation of sex. So this is where they go on to talk about, you know, each, you know, they talk about a microscopic transsexuality. They talk about making love is not just becoming as one or even two, but becoming as a hundred thousand desiring machines cool. or the non-human sex, not one or even two sexes, but in sexes. Schizoanalysis is the variable analysis of the in sexes in a subject beyond the anthropomorphic representation that society imposes on the subject and with which it represents its own sexuality. The schizoanalytic slogan of desiring revolution will be, first of all, to each its own sexes. Do you recall whenever I want to say that it was one of Elon's tweets where I think Nick Land uh, quote tweeted it or some shit. And it was like talking about how sex outside of the function of procreation is pointless or like irrational right. or, or some kind of shit like that. And yeah. Because at the time I was reading this chapter, I just responded to Nick Land saying, what about your non-human sexes? Right, <laughs> right. He yeah. Totally, he totally whiffed on, <laughs> didn't get the. Didn't get what yeah. I was doing, but he whiffed on it. And I think that it's easy to see what they're saying as if we still take it on a molar level, we could still be trapped in an identity politics where it's like, well, I where they're saying like each person is allowed to, you know, identify with the set of pronouns that they best feel fits them. And that is undoubtedly true. But their point being that it's actually at a more fundamental level, at a more this more um, molecular level, that we're all in sexes, right? And so those pronouns that we choose to identify with and, and perpetuate or, or, or to approach and navigate social situations, that's obviously something that should be respected, et cetera. I'm not calling that into question or trying to be like anti woke yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. I'm merely saying that I think for them, that is a consequence or that freedom, if you will, or that responsibility too, if you will, of acknowledging and respecting other people's pronouns or na navigating one's own relation to those. That's a consequence to a more fundamental aspect of uh, design production and design machines. So for them, you know, this question of and I like how it ends to each its own sexes, right? There's a yeah. There, there's a gender neutral, it's, it's a good, a yeah. gender in inclusive aspect to it. For them, right. you know, they wouldn't necessarily think of the direct struggle to, you know, 
allow one to, whether it be experiment with gender or even uh, self-articulation, self-fashioning, et cetera, et cetera. I think they would, they would find it baffling the backlash to what people are allowed to have the freedom to associate themselves with. And it just follows from this very direct, this idea that with desiring machines and desiring production, human sex is not the center of the universe. And so the human binary is already fractured from within Mm -hmm. infinitely. And even from within an individual, considered on a molar level, you have these series of, of male and female bisexuality, but also transsexuality, et cetera, that, that we're, we're sort of all, those are all informing us and sort of under the surface of the, of the static, you know, egos that we try to craft and put out in the world as the image of our identity. And I think that that's, even with a typical Lacanian, you're going to say that's just on the level of the imaginary. But I think that they, contra to a typical psychoanalytic take, you know, it's not necessarily about the structure of the phallus or on the structural level. Like these are real, the insects swarming us is for them on the level of the real and not some sort of metaphor. And I think that's what's at stake for them. And that's also why this is a hard book and, and something that's challenging to read, because I think that that the RSI coordinates have to be antagonistic to a a card carrying Lacanian or whatnot, right? When they want to forego the metaphor and metonymy and, and say what they're describing on the metaphysical plane of desire is flush with the real. One of their other random quotes that I thought was kind of a banger was desiring machines don't die. Yeah, I mean, it's again why they're not thinking of them as physical. Yeah. To a certain extent, even to say machines, physical machines can die is already problematic, right? You know, but although we do use this language a lot of time, you know, my phone's dying, <laughs> my battery's dying. We use this language all the time, though. So I will give Elon Musk this credit, and I don't think this is his necessarily his ide- original idea, but I remember listening to him talk one time, just kind of describing, I guess, in the context of like, not cybernetics per se, well, kind of cybernetics, but I guess more like in terms of cyborgs, we're already sort of cyborgs. It's just that the uh, the upload of the information, like the communication, the connection, the transfer rate of information is what is restricted. For example, our phone, right? The restriction is how fast we can move our hands in physical space. But as that becomes electronic with something like, you know, his neural link, then that that differential becomes far faster. Once we can start doing that digitally versus organically in terms of the input output, then that's the distinction. It's not it's like we're already cyborgs, but it's just the upload speed or that communication speed I mean, I mean, that gets modulated know, up or down relative not- to technological uh, technological innovation. This is not really a, a new thought. And in fact, you, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can go back to, you know, you can look at how Derrida looks at Plato talking about speech and writing for a certain extent. You know, writing was considered this technology is an aid to memory. Mm-hmm. And there's something to bemoan about that fact, because now memory is on the one hand. Yes. the Yeah. Memory gets part, degraded. Part, as... Memory gets abraded, degraded. And, you know, it's not as easy to you know, remember the Homeric chants of the Odyssey or whatever, but on the other hand, you've offloaded a task to the dead word, right? Blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, Derrida deconstructs all this shit. I I won't go back through all that. I, for one, don't necessarily want to uh, participate in Elon's (laughs) Neuralink. I mean, I don't either. (laughs) I'll let you do that first. (laughs) Nah. I'm on board with, I guess, post-humanism, but not Elon shit. We'll let Elon or at least first... tend to, I don't know. I'm let's say I'm interested in post-humanism or transhumanism. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, like in the abstract, of course, but you right. know, let let Elon be the first human to uh <laughs> implant his chip. Yeah, his I'm little... not putting his fucking chip in my head. Yeah, let let him be the first I wouldn't put his chip in your head, man. <laughs> I mean I don't I don't know if I would do that with my worst. I mean. Uh but Elon can go first. But, but yeah. You, one thing I am thinking about relative to this is or like is okay so and i hate to even characterize it this way but it's like nature produces nature tends to it has a tendency to reap to produce difference in order to develop communism there has to be a certain equivalence 
And what kind of equivalents? Well, I'm thinking about, okay, so one of the biggest obstacles to communism, generally speaking, in the social is that you have a lot of asymmetries. You have a lot of asymmetry of, okay, uh, yeah. of for one, primarily technical advancement, right? So because of that asymmetry, that allows the group with the higher technological capacity to exploit lower capacity societies, right? So that obviously that's violence, that's death, that's uh, subjugation, etc. That's enslavement. This historical development, uneven or asymmetric development of, of technological and economic production is what allows conflict to persist, right? Because you have, but if sort of everybody, it's almost like mutually assured destruction with the atomic bomb. It's like that acts as a sort of check that kind of holds things Deterrence. back. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because it's like mutually assured destruction. It's only in situations where that there's asymmetry that there's a threat. This is why, for example, North Korea, they're fucking smart to have an atomic bomb for this specific reason, because it's the only thing that can act as a equalizer if we're negotiating between two parties. Otherwise, the U.S. could just like try to invade the way that they yeah. did Iraq or I Iran or. I mean, China helps to keep North Korea autonomous, too. Let's not let's not. I mean, they, perhaps, they, I don't they, know how they, 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 <laughs> they do not want North Korea collapsing. Yeah, I mean they they, um, they do not they do not want to have to deal with with North Korea collapsing. That would be a big yeah, but I I don't know that for them. I don't know that China's interest in North Korea is as entirely let's say. I mean that's just from China's own self interest. Obviously, North Korea's own self interest is to have that threat. Oh yeah, of of retaliation. Yeah, realpolitik wise. I just meant that that this is one of those things where China is not necessarily. They have an interest in keeping North Korea autonomous and the kind of chaotic situation that would ensue if North Korea were, were to fall would impact them. And so they have a self-interest in that. But that's that's not your point. I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess I could point this out another way, too, that would maybe be better would be like, OK, if there's a technological equivalency, I'm thinking about something like the AI art generators, right? So what that does is that creates a certain... I guess there's an egalitarian aspect of it because it diminishes hierarchies of access or or sort of skill in quotation marks. Because I don't necessarily have to have I don't necessarily have to have this arcane technical knowledge to produce something. I can use this technology to produce something, thereby flattens out the hierarchy to some degree. Because I'm not restricted by knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Knowledge that is hidden behind a paywall or something like that. I'm just thinking of, I'm trying to think of the, the young guy that took his own life being prosecuted for... Uh, oh, yeah, for the JSTOR yeah. documents and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, this is one interesting element that we deal with because it makes more sense for, I guess, private property, particularly when it comes to information. You would think capitalism would push for destroying all barriers of information right and i think it kind of is with regard to like the internet and that's kind of one of the big threats of or the de territorializing impact of social media is that it makes information more prevalent that is harmful to government that can be harmful to government stability we've seen this play out numerous times right like you just can't get away with the machinery of state operating as it did in the past because people are more of aware of it now this is why everybody bitches about social media is not because social media is specifically exactly doing something what it's it is doing something in the sense that it's allowing us to see what has happened a lot of shit just was getting swept under the rug historically speaking regarding the police the government etc because you know again information was limited far more limited by space and time transmission right a telegraph a writer you know shit like that versus an email or you know i hack into your server etc i get that information so that's why it's so destabilizing is because sort of the powers that be have been getting by on this like by sweeping shit under the rug but right. i guess this is getting a little bit far afield i can probably cut out a lot of this no no it's it's since we recapitulated but it's fine i mean it's i mean i was thinking about just this the main idea i think is interesting about like okay how do we deal with difference and a certain egalitarian social. How do we make those things mesh? Because I think 
Deleuze would say, you know, difference is going to keep being reproduced. Difference will reproduce itself. That's sort of the constant thing that we have to sort of contend with. If difference continues to repeat, then how do we how do we create a a social form that is not self-destructive per se or destroys our environment? You know, for someone like Watchery, the difference between a social formation that is able to incorporate mortality within itself is perhaps different than self-destructive in the sense of destroying the viable means of living in on this earth. Yeah. I mean, going back to the death drive, it's like, I like the way that Samo Tomsik in his book described the death drive as something in the organism that wants to live irregardless of the the desire to, for that specific organism to like, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess the death drive exceeds even the self-preservative elements of the individual, of the individuated subject, let's say. Does that sound better? I mean, yeah, for Freud, it's about the circuitous means by which the organism meets its own death imminently instead of externally, from externally imposed conditions, the circuitous manner in which the organism returns to inorganic life being a kind of imminent condition of its, whether it be its species or its drive or whatever. So yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, it's like completing the loop that the self-preservative drives are going for, right? Uh, the cycle, if you will, the cycle of life or or whatnot. And I think that, yeah, so I mean, what I was saying about- Well, what's I interesting there is like even just replicating, the cells replicating is a move towards death, right? Yeah. There are little packets of death that are uh, sort of secreted throughout the organism in the, the sort of self-reproduction process. So the notion of, of associus that instead of warding off its own death and thereby ossifying and producing subjected groups that promote its power and its immortality, which is not only what capitalism does, but what perhaps every social formation on the whole, in its at least in the paranoic reactionary form, has done. Mm-hmm. And that will wrap up this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. The very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. Okay. The whole state of things, a pure violence without object at all. This is the typical violence of Violent because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in uh, block work orange.